Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. We were just finishing up supper with the babies. Gracie was throwing the hot dogs on the floor for Emma. <laughs> Okay, um, I don't know if you, were you going to wait uh, a minute or two to get started? Uh, yeah, well, people are still joining. Uh, it's uh, 6.33, maybe wait for another maybe one minute probably. Okay. And then uh, we can get it started. And you're, um, or it's automatically re recording, right? Uh, yes, it's, it's being recorded on the cloud, so. Everything is uh, rolling. And you could see my uh, slideshow, no problem. Yeah, I could. I could see that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So whenever uh, you want us to get started, we can get started. Yeah. Sure. Well, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get us started. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody officially. Um, typically, we like to see your, your smiley faces, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll make do the next best thing with uh, our virtual open house here. Um, my name is Dr. Ed Bednars and my colleague, Dr. Mosin Gamari. We're gonna be Hi, <laughs> We're gonna be presenting uh, the mechanical engineering and engineering management programs here at Wilkes University. So, um, we're, we're very excited about our, our program, our curriculum. Uh, hopefully that comes through. We, we have 52 slides, it looks like, but um, you know, we're probably going to shoot for 45, 50 minutes to talk. And then we'll, we'll try to leave some time at the end for any, any questions. Or if you'd like to type the questions into the, the chat, uh, that's fine too. Um, whatever you feel comfortable with. But uh, so. We're going to talk about why mechanical engineering specifically. <laughs> both uh, Dr. Dwyer and I have PhDs in mechanical engineering, and we're both extremely passionate about about the field. So uh, we're going to say why we why we enjoy mechanical engineering, why we enjoy teaching it, why Wilkes, why are Wilkes University mechanical engineering students prepared for the real world? They come out and uh, they're able to get high quality jobs right after graduation. You know, and how are we able to make that happen? Well. We're, we're prepared. <laughs> uh, we have um, uh, we, we've taken our time and, and really developed our curriculum. We have uh, a mixture of lecture where the, the students learn the theory, but then they get hands-on lab experience where, where they get to uh, touch the equipment themselves and and um, perform their experiments, analyze the data, do lab write-ups, and um, and learn how to write, which engineers, believe it or not, actually have to learn how to write too. Uh, we, we mentor them along the way. Um, we're we're a good sized program. You know, I want to say we're small. You know, some of our classes are 20, 25, 30 students, but no more than that ever. So um, you know, it really allows us an opportunity to truly learn the student's name. You know, especially by the time they get junior, senior level. Um, you know, we could we could be talking amongst ourselves and say, oh yeah, did you hear that? Uh, the rich got a job at this place, or Sue is working here now. You know, so we, we know our students uh, um, and, and are able to help guide them because you know we we've been there. You know, we're we're all we're engineers, all the faculty. Uh, we're going to talk about our our uh, facilities, our research, our collaboration. You know, senior projects. That's that's towards the end of their curriculum, their senior year, seventh and eighth semester. They get to design and build and test something on their own. So it's kind of their their culminating capstone experience, we call it. Uh, Co-ops and internships, we've highly, highly encouraged them to get their foot in the door with companies along the way. And that's gonna help them um, uh, get you know, get a full-time job when they graduate, which is the ultimate goal. You know, why else would you go to college? You wanna, you wanna get a job and uh, you know, be productive in your chosen career. So we're going to talk about integrity and community. So ABET is our accreditation, which Dr. Gamari is going to talk more on, and uh, beyond the classroom. You know, we, we have reach, reach, uh, reach out events to middle school, high school kids, kind of showing them what is engineering. You know, I'll talk about that uh, later on. And then, as I mentioned, we're going to have some time for conclusions. Okay, so our, our first se segment here is why mechanical engineering. 
So I, I love this. It's a, a funny slide, but I think it, it sets the tone, you know, maybe for this evening's open house. Uh, why do you want to be an engineer? Physics conference. Are things made of stuff? Philosophy conferences. Is stuff stuff? Engineering conference. Awesome stuff. Could it be more awesome? And, you know, there's, you know, we're, we have fun in our department. We have fun with our students. Um, but we, you know, we they learn. <laughs> they learn the, the math and the physics, and they learn. Um, the, yeah, the integrity and you know what it means to be a good in, uh, engineer. You know, in the real world, right? engineers help people. They they try to create products to make people's lives better. You know, um, when when they graduate, they they join the order of the engineer. It's a it's a beautiful ceremony their senior year, and they you know the, the order of the engineer. It's similar to the Hippocratic oath for doctors. You know, do no harm. So, you know, engineers always are, are asked to act responsibly and morally in society. So, um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful career. Uh, here's another reason, <laughs> you know, why become a mechanical engineer. Well, you know, if you ask the average person on the street, um, you know, who, who gets paid the most in, in our society? You know, they say, oh, my, my grandson's a, a doctor or a lawyer, you know, but mechanical engineers do very well. <laughs> and this is a... Uh, data right from ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers. The 2014 median salary for MEs nationwide is $83,000, so that's pretty comfortable living. Um, you know, but it's one thing to make good money, but can you get into that field? 277,000 jobs in 2014 predicted to grow by to 290,000 um, in the next several years, and it's going to continue growing. You know, there's always a need for people to make stuff for society. You know, so that's, that's the great thing about engineering. So, you know, we believe not only is mechanical engineering fun, but pays well. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gamari. Yeah, well, speaking of uh, jobs, uh, let's look at the projection of jobs. I mean, there are a lot of different reasons that you may have for the major that you pick. Uh, uh, but one of the probably the most important is to have a career to support your family, and if you look at the uh, the data uh, by the uh, Department of Labor about the projected number of the jobs until 2026, so between 26 and 26, 2026, we see that the highest number is for uh, civil engineers. It's a number, uh, the first row. And then uh, the second one is mechanical engineering. So that's promising. Uh, but we also, if you look at the sectors, the sections that the jobs all of the uh, jobs created in the next couple of years are gonna be uh, related to, you'll see that most of them are in manufacturing section. And in manufacturing is what, what mechanical engineering is about. A lot of you know, mechanical engineers eventually end up in, in manufacturing uh, uh, part of the industry. Uh, well, civil engineers, they end up probably you see in the construction a lot of them, not in manufacturing. So there is that means there's a lot of not, not in terms of the number, but it also in terms of the diversity of the opportunities. There is, if I ask you, just name a couple of manufacturing uh, companies, I'm sure you can probably name like 10, 20 in your area probably, especially in the Northeast, it's a very rich manufacturing area. So there's a lot of opportunity in terms of job. And also interesting, the number three here is industrial engineering. We'll talk about engineering management, which is another program that we offer in our department, which is very, very similar to industrial engineering. A lot of our uh, graduates in that a major end up in positions of industrial engineering. So you see combined together, mechanical and industrial engineering are actually, you know, they surpass the number of jobs for, for civil engineering. So that's, that's, I believe it's a very, very good motivation. If you don't know what you want to do to probably think twice about uh, continuing uh, in mechanical engineering. Can okay, we go next slide? All right. So, uh, so why Wilkes? I mean, uh, well, there are a lot of, you know, institutions in the area. Well, uh, we have Lehigh University, we have Penn State, well, here uh, we have King's College. There are a lot of different institutions, for example, if you want to kind of even go a little bit further, you can go to New Jersey. Uh, but in, if you're in the area, there are a lot of things that uh, not every institution offers, especially big universities. They have a lot of, you know, research opportunities for higher levels, like graduate, PhD students, for example, postdoc researchers. But in the undergraduate level, 
there are things that small universities like us can offer a lot, a lot better. Well, first of all, they're an ABED accredited university. So if, if you don't know ABED is uh, accreditation board for engineering and technology, it's a board that uh, uh, actually certifies and makes sure that the engineering uh, institution, they they offer, uh, they, they follow the certain uh, standards. So see a lot of universities, they have it. Not every university is ABED accredited. Uh, well, soon in three, four, five years, you will be probably looking for a job and we'll see. Uh, pretty much most of the companies, uh, the number one requirement for them is to be graduated from an accredited university. So they say, okay, there are a lot of institutions that they grant degree, but not all of them follow the, the right standards. So we are able to accredited. It. Uh, it's not new. We have, we have been uh, able to accredit for uh, more than 20 years. And we have gone through cycles of accreditation. So it's, it's, it's a very fluid process and we are updating, we are making sure to, that, that we are conforming with the, uh, with the regulation. Uh, the, uh, probably after that, one of the best thing that we offer is a small class size. Our class sizes in, in, in engineering, we, we always we shoot for something between 20 to 30. Uh, we try not to go beyond 30. Uh, if you go to large universities, like when I, when, when I did my PhD, I was at the University of Iowa. I know Dr. Bednars was at the University of Maryland. These are big universities. And uh, and typical engineering class is about like maybe 100, 120. So think about that. I mean, the, the, the instructor doesn't have the time to make eye contact with every student. That's impossible. But with 20 to 30, we know all of our students by name. Not at the end of the senior year. I mean, as soon as they... They, they have the first class with us. We know many of them just by name. And, and they know us. They know about a, a lot of things about our personal life, you know, how many kids we have. And, and it's, that's the beauty of a small uh, class size. In a lot of technical electives, we have all, even a smaller uh, sizes. We have like, for example, class of less than 10, 15, for example. And that provides a very good uh, productive environment uh, in terms of collaboration and learning experience. Facilities and lab. Uh, uh, we have uh, decent equipment in terms of uh, education. Uh, it's not that like, we, we only have them. A lot of universities have them. But what we probably offer is that if you go, for example, to a big universities, we have, let's say we have a subsonic wind tunnel, for example. In big universities, they never let you to touch that. There is probably a graduate student working with that, doing the experiment, and the students are only watching, collecting data. But here, students, we, we actually... Uh, we cherish that our students, they, they touch the equipment, we just train them and they, and they go and do that, whether it's a robotic lab, whether it's a wind tunnel, whether it's a heat transfer, fluid mechanic, machine design. We, are, uh, we, we provide some hands-on experience. We'll let them to, to, to kind of get their uh, uh, feet wet and dive into the actual work. So that's what we offer in terms of our facilities. And now we'll have the slides down the road, we'll show what facilities we have, what we can offer, uh, in terms of the specific uh, areas of mechanical engineering. Uh, well, uh, we provide uh, well, all of our faculties, not just me and Dr. Bednars, we have a lot of faculties. Everybody here is accessible and caring. I mean, it's very easy to find instructors. It's super easy. You just, you know, uh, uh, stop by the offices. Again, think about that. We know pretty much every student by name. Uh, you don't have to go through a filter of a graduate student to meet us. No, you directly, you know, schedule a meeting or just a stop by. We are in our offices and, and you meet us, whether it's for, uh, for advising, for your courses. Uh, a lot of our students, you know, uh, they come and, you know, we sometimes we, we hang up with some of our, you know, senior level. Our graduate students sometimes, you know, stop by. So we are accessible to all of them. Uh, we provide co-op and internship opportunities. We take it very, very seriously. Uh, that's something that the Bednar is actually the coordinator of that program. Uh, we bring industries, we, we bring them to the campus, aside from the job fair that we have. I mean, now because of the pandemic, everything is, is virtual, but we had uh, the uh, job fair twice, which most of the companies are actually engineering companies. They come to the campus. Aside from the, in, in the department, we bring companies, like certain companies, we bring them to the campus and they, uh, they, they interview students. So that's one thing we provide because we, we think it's important. And again, we'll have uh, specific, we'll talk about it in more detail later. And we have active student chapters of uh, major engineering uh, communities. For example, we have uh, PSP, uh, 
to side of professional engineering in Pennsylvania, for example, uh, American Society of Mechanical Engineering. It's an active uh, student chapter. Uh, uh, they, they hold, uh, for example, the antique car show. They bring the speakers to the campus. So if you want to be active, there are a lot of venues. Uh, our ASHRAE is very active. Our SWE, uh, Society of Women Engineer. Uh, we also have students. They have uh, uh, a Society of uh, Automotive Engineers. Uh, they have the, uh, the Baja, for example, competition. Uh, so if you want to get involved, you have all of these chapters. Uh, they have... Uh, uh, instructors, they have advisors around the faculty. So these are all of the things that we can offer that you probably, it's, it's really difficult to have all of them together in a large scale uh, university. Well, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so kind of uh, going off of what Dr. Gamari was saying, what's our philosophy you know, as Wilkes engineering professors? Well. There's a lot of ways to classify what is engineering, but this is this is my favorite that I've heard. That engineering is the practical application of science for the benefit of mankind. So how, how, what does that mean exactly? You know, kind of going back to my comical slide, you know, early in the beginning, scientists like to discover for the sake of discovery. And the world needs that. It's 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 cool. You know, growing up, you know, going in high school, I was interested in relativity and the universe and the Big Bang and you know, you know that's all that's all great. But what do engineers do? We take that math, we take that science, the physics, and we create um, gadgets, <laughs> gizmos, you know, things that people can use. Right? It, this technology right now is developed by engineers. You know that that we're able to talk to you all across the state, maybe the country, possibly the world. Right, just virtually. For, I'm looking at a computer screen, and, and it's it's mind-boggling that engineers come up with this kind of thing. The desk you're sitting on, um, the car you drive. You know, this is engineering. You know, so how do we make people's lives, um, um, you know, happier, easier, uh, entertainment? Uh, it's that's all engineering. So, you know, I, I believe that engineering students they entered this. Field. You know, they were like, okay, I don't know what I want to do for the rest of my life. And hey, trust me, I was there. Dr. Gamari was there. You know, when, when you're a junior or senior, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? You know, my oldest son's turning 15 this week. You know, what does he want to do for the rest of his life? You know, it's a very daunting uh, task, right? I think that you know, a lot of students that sign up for this program uh, entered engineering through one of two paths. The practical, we will call the gearhead, or the theoretical the book smart. So maybe you like tinkering with cars, or maybe you know you were just loving calculus in, in high school and, and physics, and you're like, yeah, yeah. Someone guided you along the way and said you should go for engineering. You'd be a great engineer, and that's wonderful. You know, I don't really care how you got here. <laughs> you know, our goal as professors is to help you bridge the gap between the two and do both. You know, a truly successful engineer can perform the theoretical analysis and the calculations and knows the math and the differential equations, but can also be hands-on, knows how to use a wrench, right? Knows how things go together. Because you can't design something if you don't know how it goes together and you've never um, tried it and, and been hands-on yourself. You know, that we have a, a basic machining class that, that students take and they get familiar with a mill, a lathe, a bandsaw, uh, some welding, and, uh, you know, they're encouraged to build projects along the way in the curriculum, especially senior projects, they're, they're encouraged. Yes, you go down there with a, a machinist who has experience. It's going to help you safely navigate the, the equipment, but we want you being the ones to to build it and learn how to be hands on. And um, you know, why would you have to do both? Well, depending on your actual place of work, you may be asked to lean more towards one or the other. But it's the most marketable when you have a balance. If you could put on your resume, yes, I have uh, this tooling experience, and or you know, yes, I have these projects I've worked on. So our goal as professors is in, to inspire you to invent, create, and excel in life after Wilkes. You know, it's you're here short four years. Trust me, it goes by very quickly. You know, but we want to prepare you so that you could confidently enter the workplace. Um, this is this is a great slide. Um, national recognition at Wilkes University. Who? who who outside of this area has heard of Wilkes University? Well, hopefully the word is going to spread. Um, the economic, economists, I always pronounce it wrong, uh, did a college ranking where they looked at expected earnings 
versus meetings after graduation. And they determined that Wilkes University was 25 out of 1,200 colleges. That's that's awesome. <laughs> you know, the, the Wilkes in general can help take students with lower earning potential based on economic, academic background, help them find well-paying jobs. And I humbly say that that's probably mostly due to our department. Maybe Dr. Kamari would agree with me. You know, I, I think that the mechanical engineering department really uh, helped um, this statistic in particular. And look who we beat out at number 26, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I don't know, anyone heard of MIT? All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Gamari. All right, so, well, now let's see what this program, what, what do we offer? And let's become a little bit more uh, uh, technical. Uh, so first of all, we said that we are ABET accredited. And because of that, there are certain guidelines that we have to follow. Uh, ABET has a certain number of outcomes. Uh, you see all of them, and I will go through them very quickly. And this is not, these are not just some terminology. These are not uh, some words. Uh, these are not basically uh, formalities. Uh, the fact is that we have to build all of those outcomes. We have to build our curriculum in such a way that we are following, we're resulting in those outcomes. So you see they are actually, they, they begin with very early courses. Uh, uh, they are foundation and they are built on on top of each other. So the foundation are basically the problem solving technique using math and science. And, and th that's why the very early courses like math and physics are very important. Then uh, is as uh, design is just to, to learn how to create solution for a given problem within certain constraints. Because I mean, if you don't have any constraint in the real world, it's very easy to solve every problem. But there are always constraints. There are very, very physical constraints. So uh, you have to learn how to come up with real solution, come up with realistic solution. Communication is another thing that we early on, we try to develop in our student. Uh, so not just to, to be able to, to better, better communicator to your friend, but to learn how to communicate science and technical, uh, to have a technical language. We, we try to build that in many courses, specifically in our senior design that a student will have to kind of present for a large uh, group of people. We have uh, a lot of you know, opportunities for a student to learn about the communication in different courses. And it's not just verbal communication, it's also written communication, you know, writing, uh, that sort of stuff. Ethics and professionalism, uh, it's very important in engineering. Uh, aside from the fact that we have a course specifically for that, but we try to kind of focus and emphasize on that in many different courses, how to be ethical uh, while being an engineer, while, while kind of, for example, coming up with, with a solution. And you have a lot of, you know, you, there are a lot of stories that you, you hear every day. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna give you one example. For example, you heard probably about the scandal a couple of years ago, I think it was 2015 or 16 in Volkswagen. And uh, they, they had the emission issue and they, they had kind of falsified some data. They have fabricated data. Yeah, our engine are following the, the European standard. They are following the American standard. They don't emit uh, much uh, toxic gases. But uh, it turned out that no, they, they are actually beyond the threshold. And some of the engineers, for some reason, they were under a lot of pressure, whatever reason, uh, they they made that mistake. They, they were not ethical. So it's not only costed the company a couple of billion dollars, but also for during all of those years, they, they hurt the community, they hurt the environment. So it's important to be ethical uh, in engineering. Like the way that we have to be ethical in, in other fields, like for example, in, in medical field, which is very, very important. The same thing uh, applies to engineering as well. Teamwork, uh, we try to build that also in our curriculum. Uh, uh, again, senior design, our capstone, culminates all of different aspects, but we also have the teamwork in many different courses, how to learn how to kind of communicate with each other, learn how to work together. Uh, experimentation, obviously, we have a lot of different hands-on and lab courses. Uh, sometimes I believe we, we offer more labs than a lot of, you know, larger universities with more equipment, with more kind of tools, because we want our students to know how, how to uh, not just use the, uh, their, their, their math and, and their brain, but also know how to use their hands. Uh, and also finally, which uh, is probably the last and the most, but not the least is the new knowledge. So you learn a lot of these skills, but uh, you, you need to know how to apply that uh, into different areas and also learn how to 
how to learn how to learn. You know, it's not uh, when when you graduate, it's not the end of your your learning opportunity. Uh, it's just life is a learning opportunity. I would try to kind of teach you uh, to look at the world differently, change your vision, look at the world as a learning you know environment. All right, so we can go next slide, please. All right, so aside from those major outcomes, uh, our program has some uh, program educational objective, we call it PEO or POs, like a specific outcomes, uh, which we try to, well, the, the goal of that is that at the end of the four year, we try to nurture these capabilities and these are the four major outcomes uh, and objectives that we try to nurture in our students. And, and we are really successful. We'll look at our graduates when they end up in terms of the job market or if they wanna go to higher education, which university they go, well, I have, I have a sense now he has started a PhD in, in Georgia Tech. We had a student they went to Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we, we sent a student uh, out to Penn State, uh, a lot of very good universities. And also companies, will look at them, uh, they end up with very, very uh, high ranked uh, prestigious companies. And that's because of these objectives that we try to satisfy. So competence and professionalism uh, the, is one of them. Uh, the other one is to design, develop, refine, and implement system products. Uh, we, we try to kind of, you know, uh, uh, achieve to the point that our members are leaders. They learn how to be collaborative, lead the project, take ownership of the project that they are assigned to, and also communicate effective, effectively. It's really impossible and difficult to, to be a good engineer and not to know how to communicate. It's, it's, it's really difficult. And, and that's what we try to kind of, you know, uh, to nurture and we strive to reach the point that our students, our graduates are very, very great uh, communicators. All right, so I think well now we can go probably a little bit in more detail into our uh, curriculum. Uh, let's see next slide. All right, so what we see here is uh, we call it curriculum. You probably know what that is. Uh, it's uh, uh, the list of courses that we, we offer and it's the pathway to graduation. So we are a four year program, eight semester. Uh, we have summer semesters as well. It's not included here because it's not required. You don't need to take courses in the summer or intercession to, to graduate on time. You just need to follow this schedule. I have the students, uh, a lot of my advisees, they follow exactly the same curriculum. I mean, they in the fourth semester, they take exactly the courses which is listed here, but it's not like that you have to do that. There are some flexibilities. Uh, the schedule is not rigid such that if you, for example, fail a course in somewhere, you will end up in nine semester or five years. No, that's not the case. There are opportunities to kind of to shuffle some of the courses. In some areas, uh, there is a little bit of kind of wiggle room. In some areas, you can move courses kind of you know, more up and down. So the first uh, year, the first two semesters are the foundation courses. If you look at them, there is, uh, you don't see any uh, mechanical engineering course except the ME180. That's basically CAD. You learn how to uh, do drawing using uh, AutoCAD and SolidWorks software. And uh, these two semesters, the courses right here are the same for mechanical engineering, engineering management, electrical engineering, as well as environmental engineering. So these are all of the engineering programs that we offer as of now. There are, we are working to offer uh, civil engineering. I think we are in the process of approving that pretty soon, I believe. I don't have the, uh, the recent uh, news on that, but I guess probably in a year or maybe less, we're gonna have civil engineering as well. So, well, if you have that, the first two semester for that is gonna look like the same. Uh, these are the courses that all of the engineers should take. Uh, and that kind of, you know, it's a little bit difficult. A lot of students uh, are discouraged uh, at the end of the first year because uh, they are so passionate about all of those uh, fun mechanical engineering courses. Uh, but that's uh, when you tell them, you know, hold your horses, you have to be patient. Once you finish the first year, uh, at the beginning of the third semester, that's the fall of the sophomore year, uh, there are still more of a foundation courses, but we begin going into engineering. Uh, we have, for example, electrical circuits, which is again, something that all of the engineering courses students take, as well as the first mechanical engineering course, which is statics. It's a very, very fun course. But then look at the fourth semester and right here, uh, pretty much all of the courses are mechanical or EGR, which is mechatronic, only mechanical and electrical engineering students take. So uh, the bottom line here is that if you are, if you know that you want to do engineering, but they still have some doubt, uh, 
between mechanical, electrical, environmental, or management. So it's okay. You can begin your first year as an undeclared engineering student. That's okay. And by the end of the first year, you can choose your major. So the first year is the same for all of them, exactly the same. There is no difference. Uh, you can also begin the third semester kind of undecided, but probably by, by the beginning of the fourth semester, you should know what you want to do. And I, I believe that the first year gives you the opportunity to kind of to hang out with friends from different majors and you will know. We have uh, a pretty good number of students that kind of switch major uh, during the first year and uh, there is no, uh, there is no uh, enforcement. I mean, uh, we, we, once you choose, for example, mechanical, uh, if you want to switch to environmental or uh, vice versa, you can always uh, do that. Uh, there are courses here that you see are, are called uh, general education. These are courses in the area of, for example, humanity or, or non-technical courses, like for example, English, economy. Uh, there, are, uh, there, there is a range of courses. It's overall about 30 credits that you have to take, like maybe about nine, 10 uh, courses uh, that you have to take. Uh, it is not 10 fixed number of courses. There are certain courses that you have to take, for example, like history. And there are courses that you have to choose from. Like for example, you are given an option between psychology uh, anthropology, uh, you know, sociology, and you have to choose between them. And that's actually good. Sometimes there's a lot of technical courses in a semester and you really need to kind of, you know, get out of engineering courses. You need something to change the flavor. And that's what I recommend uh, to my advisees to, to kind of spread them around. Uh, some students want to get rid of them as soon as possible, uh, but it's, it's a good practice to kind of spread them around and they change the flavor. And meanwhile, you hang out you know, with, with other students, there are cool courses, especially when you are in engineering courses, you really uh, uh, understand the value of courses like in philosophy, you know, wh why philosophy is important, a lot, especially like the philosophy of science. So, so these are uh, kind of complementary uh, to engineering courses. Uh, we have uh, technical electives, you see probably begin uh, in, uh, in the uh, junior year technical electives, uh, we offer a wide range of courses uh, in, in specific areas of, areas of mechanical engineering. So for example, if you want to focus on thermal fluid area, you're interested in HVAC, for example, we offer courses for ventilation, we offer courses in thermodynamic, which are not part of the curriculum, you don't have to take them. But if you want to, for example, kind of, you know, hone your skills in a certain area, maybe if, you, if your target is a job, for example, in, in, in for example, in HVAC market, and you wanna write after your graduation, you wanna go and get all of the certificates. Uh, so it's a good opportunity to take those courses. If you are interested in, for example, in manufacturing, we offer courses in, uh, uh, in, in micro, uh, 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 micro fabrication. Uh, we offer courses, we have a very, very good uh, 3D additive manufacturing lab, 3D printing. So we can take that, we can take, for example, courses in the machine design area with Dr. Bednar's or nanomaterial. If you're interested in robotics, we have a certain section of courses related to robotics, for example. So it's up to you. You can change one from each area. If you want to try each of them, kind of get some knowledge, or if you want to have a deep understanding of a certain area, it's totally up to you what you want to do with those courses. So that's uh, our job is to provide the pool of good courses, and then you have to choose uh, among them. Uh, we have a co-op here, if you see, uh, in the third year, uh, in the sixth semester, actually. And a co-op is when you go and, again, Dr. Benaz will talk about it, uh, when you, during the semester, will go and work for a company. If you find the opportunity, there are a lot of companies in the area that are interested in uh, students. Uh, you will be paid for that. Uh, you will get some experience. Uh, a lot of students are hired after graduation. Uh, by the company that they interned uh, for or the company that they have some co-op with because they know them, you know, it's just a lot of, you know, things based on, they, they know about them, they know what are the skills they need. They have developed their skill in that, pro, in that period, for example. And, and the most important is that you can, uh, you can use that co-op towards your degree. So up to between three to six credits. So you can choose two of those technical electives uh, to be your co-op. So you go to work, uh, you, you get some experience, you are paid some good money, and 
at the same time you are passing six credits. So that's why we we are we are we, we value here uh, those uh, co-op courses. Uh, here is the same curriculum that you saw, but here is uh, uh, we call it flowchart that tells you uh, shows you what is the order of courses. There are basically three categories. Uh, you probably can guess those in green are math and science courses like physics and chemistry. Uh, those in purple are uh, mainly engineering courses, mechanical. Uh, there are some uh, EGR, which are engineering courses. And those in kind of light, uh, I don't know whether it's orange, I guess, light brown, they are general, general education courses. Uh, they are connected with uh, arrows, if you see. Uh, the arrows are, we see two types of arrows, the, the solid arrows, which means if two courses are attached with a solid arrow, that means that one, the course on the upper stream is prerequisite to the course in the downstream. That means that you have to take this one first, pass it, so that you can be allowed into the second course. If they're connected using a dash line, that means that you can't take these two courses at the same time. That means that's, that's co-requisite. And if you see that we do, do not have any, we call it critical line, we don't have any critical line that connects a course after a course after a course for the eighth semester. Some schools have it. That means that if there is a critical line, if you fail a course somewhere in between, there is no way but to finish in more than four years. We don't have it. We try to kind of, there are courses that are offered in more than one semester. There are courses that we offer every semester. So we try to kind of you know, provide the opportunity. There is not only one pathway. This is the optimum pathway, obviously. But this is not the only pathway to graduation. And that's why uh, we are, uh, aside from being the instructor, professor in research, we also provide a lot of advising for our students, what is the right pathway for them uh, to graduate. So this is for the mechanical engineering. Well, that's my daughter. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> so she was sleeping, she just, you know, uh, yeah. All right. So that's, yeah, that's a little bit flavor because of the pandemic. So this is the curriculum of our engineering management. So we not only offer mechanical engineering, we also offer engineering management, which uh, kind of gears towards the uh, managerial part of the engineering uh, 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 projects. Uh, you see that the first two semesters are very similar, again, uh, pretty much all of the courses that you take as a mechanical engineer. Uh, there are a lot of technical courses that both mechanical and engineering management take, like, for example, fluid mechanics, thermodynamics, fundamental courses, because how can you manage a project if you do not understand about the basics of it? So there are certain courses that they take, but if you look at the course, especially in the third and the fourth semester, the focus of the courses, they are geared towards uh, the, the management or the finance aspect of the project. So how, how, you, how to control project, how to plan for a project, what are the, how to finance uh, the project. Uh, so what are the aspects uh, of the uh, successful project it is? And it's very, very similar to industrial engineering. Again, this is not industrial engineering, but if you look at that, a lot of our students, I mean, pretty much all of them, all of our, those who graduate end up in positions which are open for industrial engineers. And that's another thing, we can go back to the slides that we had in terms of number of jobs for mechanical and industrial. Number one was civil, number two was mechanical, number three was industrial. So mechanical and, and, and engineering manager combined, they are actually number one in terms of number of jobs created in the next couple of uh, years. Uh, overall, both majors, they need you to take 130 credits. You can take obviously more than that. I have a student take more. Uh, aside from these majors that you choose, you can also choose a minor. We offer, for example, minor engineering management, which means that uh, if you are a mechanical engineer, by taking an, an extra six credits, uh, if you are careful in terms of planning your courses, uh, you can also get a minor injury management. There are minors that offer it, for example, in physics, uh, the same way. Uh, if you are smart in terms, in, in terms of taking your technical electives, you can take courses that count towards your ME major and your physics minor. So a lot of students 
uh, they, they end up taking, it's a 130, they take 136 credit, which is easily manageable in four years. And they take both a major and a minor. Uh, here is uh, the, the flow chart. Uh, well, I'm not gonna go over that. Uh, you will have access to all of these documents, but basically I see, uh, uh, well, we don't have much of an AME courses. There's a lot of EGM courses here, which are injury management. And again, they are uh, more about the management, uh, how to lead a project, how to control a project, how to finance a project, you know, uh, the managerial uh, aspect of uh, every project. Okay, so now uh, we're going to talk about mentorship and get into who we are as faculty and staff. And um, I know this, this seems like such a cliche slide, but we totally stand behind it. We, we truly, truly are faculty that cares. And Wilkes is primarily a teaching school where our undergraduate education is emphasized. It's not just, oh yeah, by the way, we also offer a BS program. That's our main focus. We do have a master's program that we've been trying to grow and we have master's students that we, we uh, work with uh, research on. But um, a lot of our research, and I, I know Dr. Gamari and myself, most of our research actually occurs with uh, undergraduate students helping us. So um, I think that that also makes us unique. Our students are well prepared for industry and graduate school. Uh, we have many, many students. Uh, they go on the Lehigh for PhD program. I know Dr. Mario mentioned uh, a few different schools that go on for master's degrees, PhD, uh, or right into industry. One thing that I thought of with the, um, the economic slide earlier on, um, our students typically get jobs in the $60,000 range, starting salary, which in this area, which I'm a, I'm a local from NEPA and from Hazleton originally, and, and that's a that's a good money. That, that would be good for a whole family, let alone one person. Um, you know, our instructors do offer hands-on experience. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've said it many times already that the professors really do know the students' names. Um, there's Dr. Gamari and this, uh, <laughs> this lovely brochure here we have, uh, just kind of showing, um, and that's a quote from one of our students, uh, Rich, who a um, uh, great student we had. Uh, I think he's, he's going for his master's now currently. He graduated with his bachelor's and, and he's sticking around for another year, year and a half to, to complete his master's in mechanical engineering. So that's a possibility. So uh, here's just a brief uh, look at who we are, you know, kind of put some names and faces together. Um, you know, what, what I like to highlight from, from this chart is mechanical engineering is very diverse. You know, there's many different areas. My area is uh, mechanical design, solid mechanics. Dr. Gramari is the completely opposite end of the spectrum. He's thermal science, fluid mechanics, heat transfer. Um, Dr. Badur is nanotechnology, nanomaterials. You know, and um, our chair is Dr. Henry Castajon. Mr. Mitch Adams, he's a machinist in the machine shop, really loves working hands-on with the students. He actually does teach the machining course, which uh, I do believe was fourth semester. And uh, Mrs. Lisa Colavetti, our office assistant, but uh, she helps kind of keep the engine of the, the program running. Um, you know, she's always available for questions for students to stop by. Um, you know, if they're looking for a faculty member or need help with a form, uh, she'll greet them with a, a smile and, and useful information. So um, I think this is the rest of our department here. Dr. Jamal Garishi, uh, he's in similar area as me. I actually had him as a professor 20 years ago. I'm a, a product of Wilkes myself. And then I, you know, I went for my graduate program down in Maryland, as Dr. Mari said, worked for the Army for for uh, 11 years and came back. Now I'm teaching full-time at Wilkes. So you know, I, I couldn't stay away. I, I love Wilkes too much. Uh, Mr. Uh, William Greiner, he's similar area, but you know he comes with a lot of re um, industry experience and he's really heading up our engineering management program. You know, he's doing a fantastic job with that. Uh, Dr. Perwis Kaleem, uh, I think he's, we could, we could call him Dr. Gamari's counterpart, kind of his mentor in, in the, in the thermal fluids field. Dr. Uh, Xiaoming Mu, uh, he's doing a great job with our additive manufacturing lab. If you go in the first floor of Stark, we have a wonderful new facility that recently got dedicated three years ago, I believe with uh, 3D printing and manufacturing, um, a lot of emerging technologies. Um, Dr. Ali Razavi, he's a similar field to Dr. Badur, nanotechnology, MEMS. Um, 
we also have another lab that, that just recently got d dedicated in that, that area. Dr. Yang Zhu, he's uh, robotics. That's another aspect of mechanical engineering. So, you know, mechanical engineering is extremely broad. And, you know, kind of um, Dr. Gamari did a great job talking about our curriculum. What we offer is the breadth. So students will take fluids, machine design, robotics, but then we offer the depth. So if they're like, no, no, I really do like this robotics field. I want to learn more about CNC and PLCs. They can take the technical electives. Here's our dean, uh, Dr. Pallad Murthy. OK, so um, Dr. Gamari, I think this is you. We're going to talk about facilities and research. Yeah. So we said that one of the things that we really, you know, cherish here is the hands-on uh, uh, skills. Uh, we try to kind of, you know, uh, uh, we encourage our students to, aside from uh, a lot of different labs that we have, I mean, there are so many labs that you have to take. Uh, it's actually make the courses a lot more fun. It's not just theory. Uh, you don't go and learn about the formulas and solve problems, but you go to the lab and, you know, see how they are applied. Uh, different measurement techniques, different instrumentation, for example. And we have so many labs. We, we use them for both teaching and research purposes. And that's separate from the faculty's research lab. Like I have, for example, my own lab, which I don't use it for teaching. It's just specifically for research. But I have uh, both undergraduate and graduate students uh, that, that they work uh, for me, especially in the summer. Uh, if they want to stay in campus, they want to do research, they, uh, they, we have a lot of projects for them. So here you, have, you see the image of, uh, well, if you go back, yeah, thank you. Uh, it's our uh, subsonic wind tunnel uh, that we have. Uh, that's one of the things that we, uh, we have. Uh, we have the uh, uh, pretty good machine, uh, machine shop. Uh, we have a lab for mechanical system design, vibration. Uh, we have combustion uh, lab, which is my research lab. We also have uh, a lab for students uh, who, who they want to work on uh, internal combustion engines, especially those who, who are interested in Baja project, for example, but the Baja competition. We have a micro fabrication lab. That's if you want to take, for example, course in microelectrical mechanical systems. Uh, we have a micro fab, uh, which is uh, shared by both mechanical and electrical engineering uh, departments. We have robotics. Again, we have robotic for teaching and robotic for research. Uh, heat transfer lab, fluid mechanic lab, alloy manufacturing, which is something very new. We just got it about three, two, three years ago. Uh, with uh, so many uh, different 3D printers. Aside from 3D printers that we have in machine shop, we have a lab specifically dedicated to additive manufacturing. And it's not just, you know, that you, 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 you take your drawing and they make it for you. No, we have Dr. Mu offers the course and they go over the theory and they, they work, uh, uh, they spend a lot of time in the lab, you know, working with different type of printers, different concepts, you know, and that's a very good skill now if you want to go in the market uh, to know about the, uh, the prototyping techniques uh, that a lot of companies are now kind of, you know, moving towards uh, 3D and kind of fast 3D printing and fast prototyping. Uh, we have uh, uh, very uh, nice uh, computer labs. Uh, we just equipped them uh, just recently this year with new computers. Uh, here you see uh, some images of uh, our robotic lab. Uh, and also some of the projects that a student do. Uh, so it's very hands-on. Student learn how to uh, kind of, you know, program uh, uh, micro processors, you know, uh, boards, uh, how to, for example, uh, work with different, uh, you know, uh, motors, uh, servo motors, for example, infrared uh, uh, detection systems, you know, uh, how to uh, develop a control mechanism for them. So uh, again, these are all individual student projects, and these are course projects, not just you know research. In front of the research, Dr. Uh, Dr. Zhu also has a separate research uh, lab that is uh, that interested. The student can can work for him. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, aside from again that uh, I, I mentioned uh, the research labs that I have my lab, Dr. Uh, Bednard's. Uh, this is a project uh, from I believe one of uh, Dr. Bednard's uh, master's students. Oh, we offer master's program here. Uh, in both mechanical engineering and engineering management. And our students have the option uh, in master's program to do either uh, a thesis, a six credit thesis, or if they would, they can do three credit projects. The project is kind of, you know, uh, compact version. Uh, it's kind of faster, simpler, but a thesis is a more kind of, you know, fundamental in-depth research. 
uh, students that work on research uh, or even projects, they, they end up, uh, we, we go to conferences, uh, we, we publish, I believe this work was published by Dr. Bednar and, and his master's student. They publish in journal papers. And again, uh, it's not just graduate students, a lot of time undergraduate work in the lab. Uh, and, and that's a good opportunity. I mean, I was talking to somebody uh, yesterday uh, from our marketing department, and, and that's, in, that's something I really enjoy working with undergraduate uh, is that they, they really express themselves uh, without any hesitation, without any reservation. You know, and that's because of the passion that you have. And I really encourage you, I mean, don't, don't, don't be shy. I mean, it, whether you're gonna end up with mechanical or electrical or any engineering major or any field of science, uh, just, just keep the passion. I mean, for me, when I'm a little bit more expert in a field, uh, if they want to come up with idea, I have a lot of reservation to talk about somebody uh, with that because I, I, I want to make sure that it, it's right. I don't want to kind of, you know, look stupid. I want to look goofy. But, uh, but as an undergraduate, you should not have, that's not the right attitude. And a lot of time my undergraduate, they really offer very, very good, awesome, brilliant ideas about research. And, and, and again, uh, we, we provide the platform for them, for them. We just provide the platform. And, and after that, uh, it's up to them if they wanna work uh, on any research, kind of you know, sharpen their skills and kind of add something to their resume for, for future careers. Uh, here, I believe is one of the Dr. Bednar's. Uh, well, that's not how every research lab looks like, uh, but sometimes it's like that. I believe this is Dr. Bednar's uh, inverse engineering uh, is one of the technical elective courses Dr. Bednar's offers. And his lab is a lot of time, you know, is shared by different students from different courses. I guess some of them are senior designer students. And you see how interactive the environment is. There are a couple of students are working to, with each other. Uh, the guy, which is, it seems to kind of be sneaking uh, on them. Uh, 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 I think it's, uh, uh, he's probably Anthony. And he owns a company, I believe. I mean, this photo is from three years ago. And he owns his own company. Uh, he kind of recycles material uh, and uh, use for machining purposes. And, and this very interactive area, again, I really miss those pre-COVID uh, period. And I hope. I mean, this will pass eventually and we'll be back to that environment, uh, how the collaborative uh, environment is. Uh, with, I see some Legos, I believe, and that's probably because of the, some of Dr. Bednar's outreach activities. Uh, we bring like, you know, uh, elementary, middle school students uh, to kind of, we, we have some STEM outreach activities. Uh, so uh, we try to kind of, you know, uh, always add flavor and kind of fun into our uh, work. Yeah, well, well said, Dr. Gamari, and, and uh, he's right. I think this was towards the end of the semester, so we have senior projects going on, maybe two different senior projects team, um, but you know, and, and the outreach event. But we also do encourage the students to collaborate amongst themselves and help each other. You know, I'm, I'm the coordinator for senior projects, and we have any given semester a dozen teams all working on projects with dedicated faculty advisors that I'll talk about in, in a. Uh, short moment, but I start the course by saying this is not a competition with each other. You can help each other. You know, if someone has a good idea and say, well, I used uh, I, this type of motor or this Arduino on this other project and it worked good. You may, hey, you might want to try it on your project. You know, we really want to foster this collaborative learning environment, you know, with the students, with the faculty. They can have a dedicated faculty advisor. I, you know, um, Dr. Badur can be their dedicated faculty advisor, but if they're starting to run into issues with the fluids area, they're going to knock on Dr. Gamari's door and he'd happily help them out, even though that's not his assigned team. <laughs> you know, so we, we really do try to encourage this uh, collaborative environment. And hey, that's a nice segue into the, this next section. So here's our, our poster from uh, our most recent senior projects presentation. So our from the flowchart that Dr. Gamari uh, talked about, our typical pathway would have the students taking senior projects one, their fall semester senior year, so semester seven, and then senior projects two, their spring semester of eight semester, and then they would graduate in spring. We also, uh, some students by whatever means they get out of sequence, we have a lot of transfer students and, and maybe they came in a semester out of phase 
or, you know, as Dr. Kamari said, they may have struggled early on, failed a calculus class, a physics class, have to retake it, and maybe they want they could graduate in four and a half years instead of five years, or sorry, instead of four years. So what we've been doing in the last couple of years that's been working out great is we offer Senior Projects 1 and Senior Projects 2 both semesters. So preparing for this upcoming spring 2021 semester, we're going to have uh, several students that are going to start their Senior Projects 1 while they're, we're going to have Senior Projects 2 finishing the same semester. So we have a culminating presentation every single semester. So every fall we have a presentation for both sections and then every spring we have a presentation for both sections. Uh, basically, semester one, the goal is to have their design complete, work with their teams, work with their advisors, and then semester two, have the physical build, the testing, and the conclusion to their project, basically. And we, we encourage their creativity. I'd say most of these projects are grown organically through the students. You know, I would think that uh, Dr. Gamari would agree with me there, that the, they came up with ideas amongst themselves. They find an advisor to talk with and say, hey, I, I have this idea for uh, EcoWing. It's uh, basically a, an add-on for a pickup truck to make it more aerodynamic. And then they're working in Dr. Gamari's uh, lab to try to, to test the, the fluids flow and, and the drag. Um, so, you know, we really encourage, and they came up with their own logos. You know, these are students that, you know, are very creative. It's, it's never ceases to amaze me what they could come up with. Here's the website to Senior Projects if you want to check it out. Uh, Wilkes.edu backslash M-E Senior Projects, all one word. And, uh, you know, I know we're, we're kind of running um, short on time. We're at the 59-minute mark, but uh, if you want to bear with us, and we'll hopefully wrap up in the next 10 minutes. I'm just going to go quickly through just some some senior projects. Uh, this this one was a, um, a project I worked on with my students. My my wife Heather is an occupational therapist, and she had this idea for an adjustable wheelchair. So we worked with the senior projects team, and we ended up getting it patented. And now we're trying to sell it to a, a wheelchair manufacturing company. Uh, we want it, we think there's a need in the real world for this. So. Um, you know, Dr. Gamari already mentioned that we work with students that, you know, we present at conferences with them, we get published in journals, we can also get patents with them. Uh, here was a real world project students worked on. They, um, they helped convert an old church, Catholic church, into a parish center. So they had to do, um, you know, different creative engineering to turn these pews into different benches. And then they did some uh, analysis on acoustics because a church is built to project acoustics, but this, this parish center was supposed to be cubicles where we don't project anymore. So they did some acoustics analysis and electrical analysis and, and got to work with customers. Uh, this, this was totally a student's idea, but it was, it was a fun one. Uh, this was for a bar, <laughs> automated drink mixer, basically for the bartender to say, just push a button and say, I want a Long Island iced tea. And then they had... Um, a system that would take different shots from different bottles. What you're seeing there is just colored liquid. We assure you there was no alcohol on campus there. Um, but, it, you know, I thought that was a fun uh, real world project they came up with. It was a nice electrical mechanical uh, collaboration project, cross discipline. You know, uh, we may wonder why is robotics in mechanical engineering? Isn't that kind of electrical engineering? Well, it's both. And, you know, as our students can graduate, as a mechanical engineer and end up doing programming and robotics and you know so we try to give them exposure to sensors and, and robots and, and different aspects of engineering as a whole. Uh, here's a, a fun project, the Rube Goldberg machine. Basically it's a um, overly complicated way to do a very simple task. Uh, if you've never heard of Rube Goldberg, uh, take some time after this presentation and just type in Rube Goldberg machines in, in YouTube and you, you will uh, not be disappointed. Uh, this this was a great project. These you know, and a lot and all these they came up with by the students themselves. They found a way to turn um, gravity into power to charge a cell phone. So say you're out in the woods and your cell phone dies, you basically uh, hang some rocks from a tree and let it fall. So you turn this gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy as the rocks are falling, and then that spins a motor and charges a cell phone enough to make an emergency call. Brilliant idea and, and wonderful execution. 
Kraken Board Sports. Uh, here's a, a couple of great students we had. Um, you know, as Dr. Gamari mentioned about Anthony Prado earlier, he, he started his own company. Uh, these guys here, Dan Likens, Mike Robinski, uh, they, they started their own company and they're still selling these these units several years after graduation. I, you know, I just saw um, Danny, you know, pre-COVID, we went, you know, for a, a sandwich on the square and, and he said, yeah, we're, we're doing well. And basically this was a way to snowboard on flat land or wakeboard without a boat. So, the, you know, they were um, sports enthusiasts, I guess you'd say. They love wakeboarding and snowboarding, and they wanted a way just to create a winch system to do it for themselves. Uh, here's just a couple other senior projects. Pumpkin Chunkin, you may have heard of that, where we launch pumpkins. So uh, this team, they, they built their own Pumpkin Chunkin, and they were launching pumpkins across the Greenway. Uh, public safety sort of walked by, paused, saw what we were doing. I said, don't worry, it's for engineering. It's all good. And you know, the security guard would just keep walking, <laughs> shaking their head. Oh, those crazy engineers, they're always doing something uh, nutty. Uh, this, was, this was a great real world project, a high lift dump trailer, where it was a way to dump. Um, so basically, if, if you had mulch and you had to dump it over a fence into a yard, um, it, it would lift up with a scissors lift and, and, and dump. And I, I was the advisor to this team, and when they were first pitching the project to me, I said, hey, you guys are going to go way over budget. <laughs> the students are given a $500 budget, you know, an en actual engineering constraint that, you know, you could build whatever you want within this $500. And I said, you're going to be an order of magnitude or more above that. So they actually went out and found a sponsor to help them build this. And they actually got it working, and they built it, and, and there it is in the parking lot of Stark. You know, amazing the initiative these students have. Here's a snippet of what the senior project's presentation will look like. This is in Stark 101. Um, this actually, we don't have any classes in Stark 101. This is a couple hundred seat auditorium, I, I suppose. Um, none of our students typically take a class here except for their final senior project's presentation. But it's amazing, watch them start out as sort of shy freshman, sophomore, presenting to a class in front of 15 people, you know, maybe being a little nervous. And then by the time they get to their senior level, they're confident, they're just nice, and, and uh, you know, they're business casual and, and business formal, and, and they're confidently saying, hey, this is what I built, and this is what I made. So it's, it's wonderful uh, watching their evolution as students. Uh, so here's kind of just a snippet of the, the co-op that Dr. Gamari said, and here's some companies. You know, there's, it, it is unbelievable how many local companies there are in, in this area that are eager to hire Wilkes engineers. Uh, and I, and here's just another uh, slideshow of some companies and their logos, but I really got to highlight Sharon Castano on the right. She's the director of internships and co-op education for all Wilkes students, but I think she has a special place in her heart for mechanical engineers and, and you know, uh, specifically, she helps them with their resume, she helps them with interview skills, uh, she helps them get a LinkedIn profile, uh, you know, how, how do you land that job, how do you land that co-op? And most of the time, if they're able to get their foot in the door as sophomores, juniors, seniors, maybe work a summer at a company and then, you know, during winter break or even throughout the semester, 10, 15 hours, and usually the company will hire them, you know, if they say, yeah, uh, Joe or, or Sue or Bob, you know, they're, they're working out great. Yeah, do you want a job? <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, we, we highly, highly encourage these students to, to get their foot in the door while they're students. And, um, and that really helps them in their path. Here's a collaboration with, with local company. Um, we worked as a partnership with Mountain Productions. This was uh, independent studies. Team I had, where they took a, um, a problem this local company Wilkesbury needed. They um, mount productions. They they deploy temporary flooring for events. You know, think huge graduations or carnivals. And then when they take them back, they're covered in dirt and grass, and they need a way to wash them. And they were manually power washing every one. It would take them several minutes per panel, and they would have several hundred panels. So. You know, our students, they came up with a way to cut time, you know, 
10% of the time, you know, like one-tenth the time and, um, you know, greatly increased productivity for this company and it was partially funded by the Ben Franklin Institute. So, um, you know, many thanks to Ken Krepke on the left uh, for helping to, to fund the project and help the company out. So, you know, it was, it was a win-win-win situation. Our students got experience and they got to use their engineering knowledge and get hands-on real-world experience. Uh, the company got a working system that they loved, and um, it, was, it was a great project to work on. Uh, here's uh, the last student I want to, last couple students I want to highlight, uh, Adam on the left and Andrew on the right, working at Toyota in Michigan. Um, Adam, Dr. Gamari and myself, we, we both knew him exceptionally well. He, um, I think he was your advisor, advising maybe, but um, you know, he he was a very passionate student, and right from the get-go, he said, I want to work for a car company. And, you know, that was his dream. That was his, his goal. And we we encouraged that. We said, yeah, that's great. Let's let's get you there. <laughs> you know, and Sharon helped him out, and then, you know, we worked with him on, on several projects and helped with his resume. And now he's working in Michigan for Toyota, and um, he loves it. You know, and he, and he actually, he's, he's a guest speaker now that comes back as part of our, um, our lecture series. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Gamari just for the last couple slides in conclusion, and then we'll stick around for any questions. So just hang out with us for a few more yeah, minutes. We are short in time, so let me just quickly skip over these uh, through these slides. Uh, so again, uh, we we have a lot of we said it's we are integrated, and we have uh, a lot of you know we try to kind of you know encourage students to get involved, not just you know to take courses, pass put some good grades but also, you know, engage in community, uh, whether the local community or the scientific community, professional community, that's why we have all of these uh, professional uh, student chapters of ASME, SWE, ASHRAE, ASHRAE uh, Society of Automatic Entry, SAE, for example. Uh, aside from them, we have like every uh, week, Tuesdays and Thursday between 11 to 1 p.m., we call it club uh, hour. And that club, during club hour, those four hours total, there's no classes across campus. We're not allowed to have classes. We're not allowed to have meeting with students. That's four hours for students to, to engage in the student activities. And there are a lot of different student uh, groups and activities, again, aside from like a student council, many different clubs in the university. Uh, and a sport group, for example, if they want to, for example, get involved and we encourage them, uh, the school supports them, uh, it finances them. They, if they want to invite uh, outside uh, lecturers, speakers, for example, there are so many opportunities. If you want to get involved in the community, uh, there, is, there is opportunity for that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, we get involved in uh, outreach programs, again, uh, our Students a lot of time help us with that. Uh, here is, I believe, uh, Dr. Bednar's lab, uh, uh, an outreach uh, activity for, for fifth graders. And again, that's what we do. We try to kind of give back to community and we encourage our students to do that. I mean, uh, we, are, we are nothing without the community around us. Uh, so they support us and we try to kind of support them. Next slide, please. All right, so for the conclusion, uh, mechanical engineering is a very, very rewarding career. Uh, well, in general, engineering is very rewarding, not just mechanical. Mechanical engineering, especially because it kind of, you know, uh, you're working a lot of time with your hands, you're touching objects, uh, you see uh, what you make or what you design in, in outside world, in the physical world. Uh, a lot of time it's, uh, it's very uh, rewarding, especially for people who are a lot of kind of more extrovert. Uh, uh, we, we try to give you the skills. We, we try to kind of, you know, nurture the, the skills that you need to, to, uh, to, to design and to, to become a good engineers. And how, how are we, we are different with other schools? Well, we, we try to kind of, you know, uh, we give you the hands-on experience, uh, caring faculty, uh, industry connection through co-op internship in our uh, Office of uh, Industrial uh, Collaboration. We have a charity center uh, that provides a lot of opportunity to, to collaborate with industry. Uh, and also small class size. Again, something we, we try to kind of make it a very, very friendly environment uh, between the students uh, and faculty. Uh, here uh, is a statement, uh, is actually um, uh, uh, a quote by uh, uh, Steve uh, Wozniak. Uh, uh, he's a co-founder of uh, Apple with Steve Jobs. Uh, they founded Apple, uh, I think as a computer engineer, uh, but 
his statement, I believe, is true uh, for for all of engineers. Uh, uh, that uh, well, let me read that. I, I hope uh, you'll be as lucky as I am. The world needs inventors, uh, great ones, obviously. You can be one if you love what you do and willing and are willing to do what what it takes. It's within your reach, and it will be worth every minute you spend alone at night. And, and that's that's really true. It's it's really rewarding. Uh, every minute we spend at, uh, alone at night thinking and thinking about what it is uh, you want to design or build, it will be worth it, I promise. And again, that doesn't matter whether it's a mechanical component, electrical engineering, or you're, you're developing a computer code, code, the time that you spend, the outcome is always, always uh, rewarding. So I think that concludes. Uh, uh, our presentation, we went a little bit over time. Uh, we are still open for questions. Uh, some people ask questions in the chat. I already answered them. Uh, there is one more question here by Matt. Uh, let me quickly go over the question people asked uh, and, and answer them very quickly. Uh, well, first question was, are any classes taught by graduate students or they are all uh, taught by, by professors? No, we don't have graduate students teach classes. We have them helping us. For example, when I go to a heat transfer lab, sometimes I have graduate assistant that help me because it's difficult to kind of you know, uh, answer all of the question, but I am the person who is in the lab for the whole duration. When it comes to lectures, we never have any graduate students. They typically help us in terms of grading assignments, or if there's a project hands-on, they help us to kind of, you know, uh, well, you know, Two, two brain, two, two people is a lot better than you know, one people when it comes to like maybe 20 students. But all of the classes are taught by, by professors. The other question was, uh, all uh, courses are offered by, uh, well, uh, the, the, the question was about the teamwork and do, we a student, do the students have to wait until the senior design to work uh, as a team? Well, that's not the case. A lot of our uh, courses, uh, uh, they have team project. Like for example, I was uh, co-teaching uh, a MEMS microelectromechanical system with Dr. Rosavi and we defined project students in team actually they did that and it was a multi-component project we had to kind of do much fabrication we took them to Lehigh University for part of that uh, in robotic projects are team projects uh, I think Dr. Uh, Bednar's uh, in machine design I don't know if, if, uh, if there's a project or not sometimes it, these are individual but but no you don't we don't wait for students to do or to get involved in teamwork until the last year we begin uh, from uh, early on. Yeah, actually, the other actually uh, about, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, let me chime in quickly. Every single class I teach, I have a team project. <laughs> I teach statics, strength of materials, machine design, inverse problems, advanced CAD, machine design too. <laughs> Every single course I teach has a team project. So yeah, we, we definitely want to get them used to working with their peers and collaborating and, and group work. And um, yeah, so pretty much from freshman year on. I teach freshman course, the FYF course. Yeah, from freshman year on, we want them working as a team. So yeah, go, go ahead. Go. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, the other one, which is a very interesting question is about uh, uh, students involved in sports. Uh, what the question is, uh, engineering, because it's very demanding, is it possible for them? It is actually possible. We have uh, quite a lot of students, uh, student athletes in both engineering and, and very active and successful in, in the sport. Uh, for, well, let me, well, Nico, for example, is one of my students. He's a double major in mechanical and electrical engineer. Uh, he is going to finish in four years and he's also at the University of Lacrosse team. He's very active. Uh, we have uh, one of Myerstone Nick, he's in the uh, swimming team and uh, he's in mechanical injury. He's going to finish on time, four years. Uh, he's uh, three plus uh, GPA. We have students in tennis, uh, lacrosse, uh, baseball. We have other students in baseball. Uh, Dr. Bednars probably knows uh, more. Okay. It's Ida. <laughs> Dr. Bednars probably, yeah, it's Ida. Dr. Bednar probably knows a lot more students. If they want to, well, there are a lot of, you know, sports. Uh, uh, I think this, the university is part of NCAA. Uh, so uh, if, uh, if the students want to get involved in them, yes, they, they can. And uh, we try to be flexible. Uh, uh, they, there are certain times that the students have their, their exercises and we try uh, to, to be flexible in terms of, you know, assigning uh, uh, the, the assignments or in terms of the exam time. 
you know, we, we try to kind of be very collaborative and that's uh, something really doable. Yeah, I, and you know, just to touch on, I was, I was a student athlete at Wilkes. I played tennis. <laughs> so, um, you know, we have a really good tennis team now. They, they pretty much win the MAC every year. Um, and I think, Dr. Murray, I'm not sure if you, you mentioned it, but yeah, we try to help our advisees on a one-on-one -on -one basis as they're scheduling their classes. You know, I have advisees who says, oh, I'm in, I'm in softball or I'm in lacrosse and here's my, my practice times. Um, can you help me schedule around that? Yeah, so you know, we, we try to work with the students there. But yeah, it's um, both are demanding. That's for sure. You know, we, we we never try to sugarcoat the rigor of the engineering program. <laughs> you know, it, it really does take a lot of effort. It's not an easy degree, but if it was easy, everyone would do it. You know, but um, no, if, if students are, are dedicated, we try to tell them, you know, use your time wisely. You know, if you're going back to your dorm room, are you just on YouTube for? five hours or are you getting your homework done <laughs> yeah you know yeah so um there's a lot of uh responsibility when you when you get transitioned from high school to college and um... now there's one more question that uh ed you may know better uh, the question here is are there any additional scholarship opportunities for students willing to participate in any band program at a, at a school offers um uh, that's that's a good question. I do know uh, our students participate in in the uh, band, the music program in general, theater. You know, like our students participate in all that. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure off the top of my head of specific scholarship opportunities, but I would say look around, talk to um, admissions, right, Dr. Kamari. There might be a way to. They they definitely uh, know a lot better. Uh, also, yeah. there's a question for. Uh, scholarship for international students who are unable to afford uh, the cost. So I, I know that, again, this is the question that you have to ask of uh, admission uh, program because, well, based on the, the qualifications, they may they offer a packet, actually. They, they may offer you some discounts, some scholarships. Uh, some of them, I know that you have to be uh, probably citizen or resident to be eligible for them. But uh, there may be some some funding available, and, and when it comes to discount, I know the university has much more flexibility. Uh, when when it comes to bringing a uh, good talent, the student, uh, the student probably uh, uh, is 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 probably ready. Again, I I'm, I don't know. I have to say it or not, but the student is ready to kind of stretch a little bit, uh, be more flexible to to bring good talent to the school. But make sure to talk uh, with admission uh, about that. They are they have the final word on that. Are there any uh, questions anyone wants to ask just face to face or I guess uh, virtually face to face if you don't want to put it in the chat. Uh, feel free to unmute yourselves at the bottom left. Uh, you may have seen them. there's a little. Yeah, I don't have any, I don't see any question in the chat. The yeah. yeah, if you want to ask questions using your microphone, yeah, feel free. I mean, that's that's also an option. Um, you know, or I, I think I, I put this up pretty quickly, but if I share my screen again, here we go. Here's our email addresses. Uh, I'm edward.bednars at wilkes.edu, and um, Dr. Gamari is mosin.gamari at wilkes.edu. Feel free to reach out to either one or both of us if you have any other. Other than that, I guess, uh, thank you. We hope to see you at Wilkes. Oh, one more just popped up in the chat. Do most yeah. academic activities go on during the week? Yeah, you know, I think um, the club hours during the week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 11 to 1, as Dr. Gamari mentioned, and um, and weekends as well. Yeah, they're, yeah. they're pretty good about scheduling before, around Before students. COVID, for example, if there was no COVID, uh, the, the campus and the, the academic buildings and Henry Student Center, they are open to students 24-7. Like our computer lab is open 24 seven for students if they wanna work on their project or if they have a club activities, they have, there are certain areas of campus that they are open. Again, it was before COVID. After COVID, there are some serious restriction, even for faculty, there are certain times that we can go to campus. But still, if when it comes to the need and demands by students, there is we always find some way as long as we communicate it with the public safety, with our deans, 
we always, you know, kind of, you know, manage to get the permission for students. Again, once, once this COVID situation is over, uh, there, is, there is a lot more opportunities. There is a lot more flexibility in terms of accessing what Wolves can offer. Oh, we got a, a question that popped up. Um, average class size again. They were asking about the average class size, mostly. Uh, the average. I think. Class um, size, probably that came to. Well, I was just gonna say that the lectures, you know, as we we're saying, were. Yeah, there. What are what are some of the average class size for most yeah, classes? Right. For the engineering classes, twenty to thirty for lectures. Labs even smaller, actually. Right under twelve, I would say even pre-COVID, <laughs> you know, was was under twelve because we wanted the students to work maybe in a group of one on a, on equipment together, so both students could get hands on, or each individual student could work on a project. So labs are even smaller. Um, I think I, I can't speak for every program. You know, there may maybe a physics lecture. They may have. I think they have small lectures, but then they have maybe one discussion that's that's fairly yeah. large. I guess you know, that's the case. The lecture, is, the lecture is pretty big, but the lab, also physics, they have also labs, and the labs are very, very small. Uh, the question was, can we get to know each other as new freshman students? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we, we definitely encourage it um, you know, to learn. You know, especially the first three semesters, um, you know, as Dr. Gamari was saying, that you actually get to know students from other majors. And um, your gen eds, you get to learn students from completely different majors. You know, you may sit in a class next to nursing students and, and uh, political science majors and history. <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah, we, we definitely uh, encourage students to, to get to know each other as freshmen. Uh, I know, you know, as a former student myself, there was lots of uh, cool events on campus. They had dances and, you know, different ways you could get to know each other. Um, yeah, I mean, at this time, yeah, I know it's, it, you mean during COVID, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a, it, it is a different period. Our campus is kind of both virtual and face-to-face -face at the moment. There are some classes that are, are meeting face-to-face. -face. There are some classes that are meeting virtually. Um, I know the whole MAC canceled sports last fall. You know, I wasn't just Wilkes, it was the entire area canceled sports. Um, you know, as far as club events, I can't really speak, but I would assume some clubs were trying to hold virtual events, you know, to try to keep it going. Yeah, we, we hope that, yeah, that but, this but pandemic the ends the soon, you know, the vaccine. The dorms are open and, and in the fall, so, we don't have the, the, in the fall, we didn't have the club hours. But I, uh, I, the last email I got from the president, I realized that uh, in the spring, club hours are open. So I guess we are going to have Tuesday and Thursday, 11 to 1, uh, club, uh, can, club can resume their activity. And that's a good sign. That's, that's right. a good opportunity. Probably they're following the, the, uh, the protocols for COVID. Uh, in the fall, we didn't have that. Totally everything was shut down. But in the spring, the club are going to resume. And that's a good opportunity, you know, to, to, to get to know students from other majors and, you know, uh, get involved with the community. And, you know, as I, as I was saying, that I think, hoping, you know, everybody's globally is hoping the pandemic goes away soon. But, you know, with the vaccine coming out, there's a possibility that our campus will be much, much more back to normal by the fall. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, but, you know, of course, nobody can predict what's going to happen there. But, um, yeah, I do think a lot of activities are going on, you know, as Dr. Gamari mentioned, safely. You know, it looks as a, a COVID response team that's been working um, stringently to, to make sure that everyone's um, socially distanced and masks on campus and, and all that. Um, but I know they do have virtual events to try to help students still, you know, uh, get to know each other. Um, I know the, the freshman course I taught, we had a virtual symposium. So that's that's a way that all freshmen, every single freshman has to take FYF 101. They may be in different sections, but at the end of the year, they come together for a virtual symposium. And, and that's a good way that um, they can also get to know their, their classmates at Wilkes and our whole, not just engineering. Okay. Um, 
great questions. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot more questions. Just, oh, most of you're still muted. Sorry. Yep. Yep. Uh, I was gonna say, if there is no <laughs> question, we can probably adjourn. Do we see any new question? I think we answered all questions, right? Yeah, there's more questions in this open house than the last one we did a couple of months ago. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and feel free to email us if you think of something after we hang out. We're available. We're, this is almost a 24-7 job. <laughs> I'm answering emails at 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock at night. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank and, you, everyone. Uh, and have a great day.